Welcome everyone to the webinar, Jesus Through the Middle Eastern Eyes. The real image of the first century Jesus. We all know that Jesus is not blonde or blue eyes or Western European looking. We can see that in the Hollywood films for the last 50 years, they are doing their best to show Jesus in his proper cultural context. Maybe you've seen the Passion of Christ, the movie, and heard the Aramaic language. Also, you've seen the Chosen too. I'm here today to teach you more about the context of Jesus as the Middle Eastern. We're going to learn about the real image of Jesus because every culture cast Jesus image in their own understanding for examples Americans Westerners European see him a modern like bluish eyes European style Ethiopians see him as a dark tan black man in the Byzantine Empire, in the Byzantine period, in the fourth century, they saw him as a grand emperor. In the Middle Ages, the Crusaders saw Jesus as an image of defeated victim on the cross. In the 19th, 20th century, they saw Jesus as the enlightened, successful, middle-class person. And in the third world countries, we see Jesus as a liberator bring freedom to the people under occupation so every nation or every period of history cast god in its own image and i want to tell you it is possible to know the real image of jesus nowadays the historical image and also not only the historical image is important the spiritual the theological jesus is more important but if we focus first of the historical image, we can grab hold more of the spiritual image. For example, in the West, when you think first about Jesus, you think first about spiritual Jesus. In the East, when we think about Jesus, first we speak about the spiritual Jesus, how he spoke, his lifestyle, his language, the word that he spoke from his own mouth. So there, this webinar, we're going to learn about the context. What language did Jesus speak? And also, we're going to learn about the culture and the customs. But today, we're going to focus on the context. Most scholars, all scholars agree that the language of Jesus and his disciples was Aramaic. And this is agreed upon by historians. Because Aramaic was the common language of Judea in the first century AD. Like the villages of Nazareth, Farnahum in Galilee, where Jesus spent most of his time, were Aramaic speaking communities. But spe Jesus spoke Galilean Aramaic, is distinct distinctive from the Jerusalem Aramaic. It is also like the Jews knew enough also. Greek to converse with that was the also the major language the educational language the Greek and also Jesus was well versed in Hebrew for religious purposes and when he learned teach and read in synagogues so Jesus spoke minimum three languages also in another webinar we're going to learn about the culture of Jesus as a man will focus on the next webinar on the historical Jesus. Then we're going to learn more about the customs of Jesus as a rabbi in a third webinar. We learn how the rabbi lived in the first century, their lifestyles, the characteristics of the rabbis. And we're going to take outside biblical resources like the Mishnah and the Talmud to understand more about Jesus lifestyle but let us go to the context today what did Jesus really look like to you he is the most painted figure in all of western art 
recognized everywhere as having long hair, as you see here, and a long beard and a long robe with long sleeves, often white and a mantle on him, often blue. Or when Jesus, when people think about Jesus, how did he really look? He looks like very European. <laughs> you see the halo around him, around his face and his blue eyes and long hair. And by the way, I took this picture of painted Jesus from my father-in-law home in Texas. It was hanged on the wall. And I thought to show it to you again with long hair and mantle and much more look in a way, you know, European style. Where did we get this Western Jesus? Let me get you back in history. Zeus, Zeus. This is his image, the heavenly ruler of all the world, ancient world, Greek, Roman world. And he was very famous with this statue with long hair. You see his long hair and his long beard and the mantle on him. And he's on the throne. And this statue, well known through the Roman Empire, even the Roman Emperor Augustus had his statue very similar to the Roman god Zeus because Roman emperors want to become gods. So in the Byzantine period, we have drawings of Jesus with long hair and long beard and a halo around him. The Roman emperor, even Constantine, out of good intentions, who he wanted to put Jesus over all the Roman gods. So they put his image like a Roman way of thinking. And by the way, in the Byzantine period, they, what they wanted to represent Jesus was symbolic. They were all about meaning, all right? Not historical accuracy. They were based on the image of enthroned emperor affected by the Roman Greek word. And if you go back to history, the Greeks before the Romans in the fourth century, 32 BC, conquered the Near East. And Alexander the Great has brought all this Greek Hellenized culture. He did not only conquer land, he conquered the civilization and what we call Hellenism. And he brought the Greek culture with Greek cities and Greek language as a common language of the empire and later became the Roman Empire. And during the Roman Empire came the time of Jesus and the Jews, but the Jews refused to bow down to the Greeks or Romans. And they did not want really to learn the Greek language. They want to keep the Aramaic and Hebrew. And if you're a Jew in the first century, you will know some Greek, but you don't want to learn Greek because it's a language from outside coming to you. And we know that in the first century, there was the, when the Romans captured Jerusalem and destroyed the temple completely, and in 70 AD, and brought man, Judaism men to captivity. And we see here a coin. And on that coin, we see how the Judean Jews, men, how they looked from that coin. Look at the hair. It's not long hair. It's short hair with a short beard. All right. So Jesus might have had a short beard like the men depicted in Judea kept a coin. But his hair was probably not very long like what we inherited from the Byzantine 4th century Greek Roman way of thinking. So this is a coin proving how Jews looked in the first century. I'm saying in general, I'm not saying probably. Also, we know about how Jesus looked with a short hair and a short beard found in a inscription from the third century. It was a synagogue in Dura Eropos. And that synagogue is in uh, all the way nearby the Euphrates River. And we have a Jewish sage, and he 
wrote and how he imagined Jews looked at that time of history. So third century is really nearby the first century of Jesus. And we see here an image of a Jew with a short beard, you see, and a short hair. And then we have a mantle on his left hand. You see the mantle and blue color, the chalukah, we call it in Hebrew. And we see the tzitziot, the tassels at the corners. So this is how early Jews depicted in the third century in a place called Dura Europos. Dura Europos is nearby the Euphrates River here in this area, okay? And it was a Hellenized town, but we find synagogues in that Hellenized town. And in one of the like synagogues, we found this inscription. By the way, it's nearby a village called Salhiya, Salhiya village today nearby the Ephratos. That's what was the earliest depiction of a Jewish figure was ever presented from the third century AD in a drawing that shows short hair. And by the way, this is more into inside how this town looked like. And here we, sign, we find the main entrance of what remains of that Hellenized Roman town, Hellenized where Jews lived under Roman occupation. Anyway, so this is the depiction of the third century synagogue of Dura Europos. Dura Europos. Here you see short hair, short beard, and with the chalukah, the mantle, and the inner garment, and the mantle outside garment. Now, on these bases, Israeli scholars found a cemetery in Mount Zion from the first century, and they found a skull. And it was simply they wanted to show how did a Jew look in the first century, not necessarily Jesus. And on that skull, they built a skin for a Middle Eastern man. And this is the result of what they had in technology. And also in that cemetery, they saw a lot of dead people and they found also nails and the nails were from the right and to the left, not in the hands, but below the hands, rusty nails. And that can be zealots. You know, remember in the scripture written that Jesus was crucified and there were two thieves, one to the right and one to the left. They were not thieves. In original Aramaic and Hebrew, they were zealots. So we have hundreds of people crucified in Jerusalem in the first century, not only Jesus, but we found this cemetery on Mount Zion and with nails of people crucified and skulls and bones from the first century. And this is Israeli scholars depicted, made an actual uh, reflection of how people might look, how Jews might look to be in the first century. So I'm not saying this is Jesus image. This is what scholars think about Jewish men looked in the first century out of scientific findings how he looked now let's get to the context the languages of jesus greek hebrew and aramaic we're going to focus about greek because jesus minimum spoke three languages anyone in the middle east today in jerusalem speaks minimum three languages he also <laughs> spoke hebrew as a language of prayer and study. And because of his years in Galilee, also he understood Greek Jesus too. But his Lunga Franca was Aramaic. Let's go to Greek. Greek is the spoken through the Roman Empire that what was affected by Alexander the Great, the Hellenization of that part of the world. And all, all the Greek and later Roman Empire, that was like the major language. And that was the language, the official language, like the language of the upper class people. And I told you, Jews would not want to learn Greek, but they have to learn, but they will not learn it because they are under occupation and they hate the Greeks, all right? They hate the Romans. 
But of course, Jesus would speak some Greek. He at least will understand some Greek. And we know that from Mark 15, 23, when the conversation with Pilate at his interrogation, he said, and Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered, and probably he answered in Greek, him, you have said so. And the chief priest accused him of many things. So Jesus would answer Pilate in Greek. That was his language, the official language. And also we see that in the Roman centurion in Kfarnahum in Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 to 7. When Jesus had entered Kfarnahum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him in Greek, shall I come and heal him? Because that was the official language of the centurion, right? The Roman centurion. So Jesus knew Greek. Also, he knew Hebrew, of course. Hebrew is the language of the scribes in the synagogues, the language of Torah. And because we know that in the first century, there was no New Testament. There was Hebrew scripture, right? There was the Old Testament. And it was in Hebrew and in many places in Aramaic, like the book of Ezra and the book of Daniel. So Hebrew was used in prayers and study language. And remember Jesus when he stood in Nazareth in the synagogue and he opened the book of Isaiah, he read in Hebrew. So we can imagine how Hebrew was a language used in a religious and liturgical way. But still it was not chosen the dialect day-by-day -day language. It was not the Lunga Franca of the first century. It was the language of the scribes and synagogues and the Old Testament. Now, I'm going to teach you some Hebrew, all right? Torah. Tav, Vav, Resh, He. Now, in the Greek translation, it's not Torah. It's the law, the law of Moses. But that is Greek translation. The law in Greek is namos. Law sounds negative, sounds like judgmental. If you think about the law, you think in Greek that God is a judge and you go to a place of judgment and you serve God out of fear. But Jesus did not come to abolish the law, which in Hebrew and Aramaic, he did not come to abolish Torah. He came to give the right interpretations of Moses' law, which he's saying, God is not the law. God is Torah. Torah is life. Torah is love. When you serve God out of love, you can serve him fully. But when you serve God out of the law, you can't serve him fully because you fear God. So Jesus did not come to abolish the law. He came to give the right interpretations of Moses' Torah. So instead of serving God by fear, you can serve him by love. And when you serve him by love, you can fully serve him. So this is a little bit Hebrew, Torah. Torah is every Hebrew word and Aramaic have root letters, four or three root letters. Torah have three root letters, Yud, Resh, He, which literally means Yare. Yare literally means an ancient way of thinking to shoot or to point. God pointed, God shooted Torah on Mount Sinai for Moses and he gave him directions. He gave him instructions and he gave him guidance. So Torah is not law. Law is negative, Torah is positive, Torah is life. Remember this, the word dig, D-I-G, direction, instruction, and guidance. This is Torah. And when you read Torah, you have life, you have directions, you have instructions, you have guidance. And you get to the mark, to the point, life, life. By the way, in Hebrew, chet, chet. Sin literally means chet, and literally in Hebrew means missing the mark. So if we sin, we miss the mark, but God is redemptive. We can get back always to the mark. Torah. So Torah is life. I'm just teaching you Hebrew first century way of thinking. Now, another thing in Hebrew I want to teach you about. In math, in John chapter 14, verse 2. In English, 
New King James says, or King James says, in my father's house, there are many mansions. Now, if we go to the Hebrew, it's different and the Aramaic, but I will start with Hebrew. The Hebrew says, Bebait Avi, Bebait house, Avi father, Yesh Harbe, there is, or there are, Magurim, many. Magurim does not mean mansions. All right? Bebait Avi, Yesh Harbe, Magurim, which means dwellings or rooms. So this is the mistranslation from the Aramaic Hebrew and then to Greek and from the Greek to Latin and from Latin to English. Of course, God will not have mansions, one big mansion for you, one mansion for the other, another big mansion. God is always equal. We have the same thing to all of us. He have dwellings, we have rooms, which means in Hebrew, the Bait Abi Yesh Harbe Magurim means there is place everyone for all of you. We are all equal in heavens. And when Jesus was saying this, even these sentences would be pronounced from Jesus' mouth. Bebait abi yesh harbe magorim, dwellings, rooms. And when Jesus said this, he was inkfar nahum. And inkfar nahum, these are the, what we call insulas and what we call a courtyard with rooms. And this is the main entrance of the insula. And this is the main road here. And there are so many rooms. So in my father's home, there are so many rooms. And you always add to the rooms because they lives together like a hamula. For example, in every insula, in every compound, insula is a compound in Greek. There are so many people living here, maybe 40 or 50. And it keeps increasing that. This is what Jesus is saying from the culture, from the context at that time. And this is the main room here, the kataluma, which is the guest room, which is always open. And there are rooms all around it. Let me show you how it looked in the first century. So in my father's house, there are many dwellings and we keep add dwellings, which means there is place for everyone in God's kingdom. And the father, which is the owner of the home, the elder will welcome everyone. And everyone is equal and everyone is living happily together as a community so in my father's house there are many dwellings all right not like the king james say many mansions dwellings so that's the context of scripture in hebrew also jesus spoke aramaic and aramaic in the first century was day-to-day -day tongue of the jewish people since their return to israel after babylonian exile and throughout the ancient Near East, Aramaic was the Lunga Franca, the language that was adopted as a common tongue between speakers whose native language was different. It functioned as the language of the markets, the homes of the people, the language of daily life. And it started 1000 BC before even the Greeks came to the Near East. Even if the Greeks came, the Greek was the net international language. Like people today, all over the world speaks English, right? But still they have their native language. So if you're in the Greek empire, Roman empire, you can travel any place in the Roman empire, but still people understand the Greek. But the Longa Frank and the local language that was not lost, that was so much used in the first century was Aramaic. I'm gonna give you a little bit more background. I speak Aramaic because it happened I belong to the ancient Near East Church, the Maronite Church, the Syriac Church. And here I'm standing with the Aramaic Peshitta Bible. We have this Bible with us today. It's in Aramaic. It's known as Syriac, the standard and authoritative text of the Bible of several Christian communities in the Middle East today. You never heard about the Peshitta before, probably. Peshitta literally means in Aramaic and Hebrew, but in Aramaic means the simple, means the common language of Jesus. It means the language that was used in the first century. Now, the Peshitta Bible written in Aramaic is the authoritative text of our Christian communities, both 
in the Middle East and all over the Near East, the Peshitta. The Peshitta is for us, is what the King James Bible is for most English speaking world. Throughout our long history of almost 2000 years, we, the Eastern Christians, lived under the shadows of various empires and it endured a long off occupied history, but we preserved the book in our churches because when the Romans came 70 AD, they want to bring the Greek Roman way of thinking and uh, they translated all the books in the world, in the Roman world into Greek and they put into fire all the Torah scrolls, all the Aramaic scrolls. And my ancestors had preserved the early church followers, has preserved the Aramaic book and hided it in the home churches. There were no churches at that time in their homes. And the Bible of the Pshita endured and survive to preserve for us an ancient biblical legacy with distinctive features and unique readings that help us better understand the transition history of the scripture. And the Peshitta is an ancient authority. And from the Peshitta, we can learn about the real image and context of Jesus. The Peshitta is also known among the Syriac Orthodox or what we call the Assyrian Church of the East or the Syriac Maronite Church or what we call the Chaldean Church. Syriac, Chaldean is all Aramaic speaking. This is, I opened my book of the Pshita, the native language of Jesus and his followers was without any doubt Aramaic. They spoke, sang, prayed, taught and wrote this language, the most famous, significant, and important prayer in all Christianity was taught by Jesus in Aramaic, the Lord's Prayer. Jesus was even expressed his final words on the cross in Aramaic. Eli, Eli, l'mash baktani. So the pshita, the pshita, the simple pshita pashut, in Aramaic and Hebrew, simple, was accessible to the common people during the liturgy of the church. Till today, till today, my home church, we have the liturgy of the same one of St. James, the brother of Jesus from the first century in Aramaic. So we kept the original text because of the persecution of the Greeks and the Romans. We hide the text in our home churches in the East and Persia, while the Greek as I said, had burnt all the Hebraic and Aramaic Bibles and scrolls and any documents translated to Greek has been went and going to the West from that time. So in the East, we always use the Pshita, but the West never heard about it. And the West start to hear about the Greek translation from that time of history. So the Pshita for us is so important and valuable. So why it should be important and relevant for you? Because it's an ancient witness to the biblical text. It provides us with a snapshot of what the scripture may have looked like and how Jesus looked like during the first few centuries of the Christian era. And any serious academic biblical project considers the Pshita as a major ancient witness. And the Pshita provides the modern Western reader with a taste of scripture as they were used in the ancient times. In the same region that the biblical writers, prophets and apostles dwelled and lived. The early, the writers of the scripture of the Pshita, of the Torah were from the Middle East, right? So this is the cover of the Pshita, but I want to go through the history after what happened in 70 AD, for you to understand the different translations, because every translation is important. I want to remind you when I'm reading for you and explaining things for you, it's not that one is better than the other. Don't put God in a box, all right? It's all a perspective. But when you go to the Aramaic and Hebrew, you get deeper understanding of scripture. Also Greek. So this is a Greek New Testament. Simply never gained ground in the Middle East. We only had the Aramaic New Testament, 
But over time, the gospel message spread into Europe. The Greek New Testament became more common. It spread faster because of the Roman Empire. It became popular just as because the Romans became Christian in Byzantine later. And just as English translation today have become popular. And shortly after the Greek New Testament, as the Roman Catholic Church gained in power and influence, the Greek New Testament itself gave way later to Latin translation. And the, foreign, the most famous Latin translation of all is the Vulgata, translated from the Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek New Testament by Father Jerome in the 4th century AD in Bethlehem. And the Latin Vulgata became the standard of the Roman Catholic Church. It was the only Bible people had heard of, the only Bible people would know of. This lasted all the way from Jerome right through to the Reformation period, a long time in history. And even the Wycliffe Bible of 1382 AD, the first translation into English, was made from the Latin Vulgata. So it's a translation from Hebrew Aramaic to Greek, from Greek to Latin, from Latin to English. Here are four translations. And the domination of the Roman Catholic Church meant that the Latin Vulgata was the only Bible it was really possible to translate from. And then we have centuries later came the Protestant Reformation and that happened in the West and scholars such as William Tyndale emerged. While they still translated the Old Testament from the Hebrew, they knew that the Latin Vulgata was not the original. They knew that the Latin of the New Testament had been translated from the Greek. And so they wanted access to the Greek New Testament to see whether or rather what errors had crept into the Latin Vulgata, either as a result of Jerome himself or later alternations by the Roman Catholic Church. Thus, the Tyndale translation later, 1525, was the first English translation which was translated from the Greek. Ever since then, the West has been enhanced by the idea that we must get back to the original Greek if you want to understand the New Testament. But I want to tell you that was not enough. All right. The Greek, after all, was what the Latin Vulgata was translated from. By getting back to the Greek, we can in one stroke remove 1000 years of translation and interpretation by the Roman Catholic Church and get back to what Jerome translated from us. Thus, in this simple way, Latin and Greek have dominated Western thinking from for the past 1500 years. Latin was the language of the academics and scholars all the way throughout the Middle Ages, even till today, all the scientific doctorate names and are in Latin, even until the 1800s. Many scholarly books were written in Latin, scientific names in medicine and all of that is in Latin, which was also originated from Rome, Latin, all right? Anyway, the bottom line. I pass through quick throughout history, but they misunderstand about the original scripture, the Pshita. Yes, it matters very much. It is something revolutionary because it means that we can go back to the first century itself when we have the original Aramaic to Jesus himself. We can understand his context to the very words that he spoke. That's our Bible from the East. Probably you never heard about this before. We can get beyond the English translation that we use today. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying that it will get you back to understand deeper Jesus. Of course, we can't put God on the, the box. All translations are great. They work in every generation, in every culture. But when you go back to the roots, to the Aramaic, you understand deeper understanding of how Jesus looked, Jesus through the Middle Eastern eyes, because we can get beyond of what we know. We can go deeper. We can get beyond the Latin, beyond the Greek, beyond the Latin Vulgata that stood as the only Bible the Western world had access for more than 1,500 years. 
we can get beyond the Greek New Testament from which the Latin Vulgata was translated. And we can get back to the Aramaic that the Lord Jesus himself would have used. It's an exciting news. It will rekindle your faith when you hear the Aramaic. I'm going to give you a few examples. It will breathe life into your Bible study. It will energize your belief in the Holy Scripture. Yes, of course, it matters. As Jesus says in John's Gospel, John 6, 63, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Of course, he spoke in Aramaic. Let me give you more solid confirmations of what I am talking about. Where did Aramaic come from? Aram Naharaim. Because, because it's really any serious, any serious academic biblical project considers the Pshita, he considers the Aramaic as a major ancient witness to the modern Western reader with a taste of ancient times in the very same regions that the biblical writers, prophets, dwelled and lived in. So Aramaic, sadly, is not taught in the West or in the, in the universities. What is taught is Greek because of the Greek influence. But at the time of history, there's still people know Aramaic. It's time of history. If you want to learn seriously, you need to know and learn Aramaic if you want to understand really to a scholar level. There are a few scholars in the West speaks Aramaic, but let's get back. Who was Aram? Aram was a son of Shem, son of Shem. And Shem was one of the sons of Noah in the Hebrew Bible. Let us read from Genesis 10, 22, 23, to prove for you what is Aramaic and how it started, even in the Old Testament. Verse 22, the children of shame, Elam and Ashur and Afrahad and Lud and Aram. These are the children of shame. And the children of Aram, Uz and Hul and Geshur and Maish, their oldest seats were in Aram Naharaim. What is Aram Naharaim? This is Aramaic word, Aram Naharaim, which means between the two rivers. Which rivers? The Ephrates and the Tigritus. Let us also read. Also mentioning another time for Aram Naharaim, Genesis 24, 10. Then the servant left, taking with him 10 of the master's camels, loaded with all kind of good things from his master. He set out for Aram Naharaim and made his way to the town of Nahur. So there are two types, by the way, of Aramaic. There is a Western Aramaic and there is Eastern Aramaic. And... In Aramaic, also, there are five uh, vowels, like Hebrew, the same. And here is a map of the two rivers. Jesus was speaking Western Aramaic. This is Western Aramaic, like Palestine, Israel, Jordan, Iraq, Syria of today, west, west of the Euphrates River. And there was the Eastern Aramaic, which is east of the Euphrates River, like Persia, Eastern Aramaic. But if you know Aramaic, you can understand both. Eastern and Western Aramaic, there's a slight differences in the vowels and the pronunciations, but it's a main root language. So our ancestors are the early church, all right? We have, we have from Nah Aram Naharaim till today, unbroken ancient footprints in following the steps of Jesus from the days of Abraham today with the same language. We are like... Aramaic is like a jewel in the hand of God. And we Aramaic speaking people from the East, we are like a jewel in his hand. And the Holy Spirit is polishing this jewel by exposing the language, the original language. Let me also read, so solidify what I am teaching from scripture. Where did Abraham come from? And what language did he speak? Look what is written in Deuteronomy 26.5. When you shall declare before the Lord your God, my father was a wandering Aramean. 
and he went down into Egypt with a few people and lived there and became a great nation, powerful and numerous. What was our father Abraham? He was a wandering Aramean. So that Aramaic was his language. All right. That's proven from scripture. Deuteronomy 26, 5. We have also more scripture saying that. Genesis 25, 20. Goes. Aramaic is an ancient language. More than 5,000 years. Till today, there's few people, villages in the Middle East, they still speak Aramaic. Today, there are few in Jerusalem, in my modernite eastern city of church, we speak Aramaic. The liturgy till today is in Aramaic. And look what Genesis 25, 20 says. And Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean. You see, the Aramean from Padan Aram. Another word, this is Aramaic, Padan Aram, which is also the area of Nahal Aram. And sister of Laban, the Arameans. <laughs> they were speaking Aramaic. Rachel, Leah, Laban, Rebecca, all they are speaking Aramaic at that time. Now, let me get to the New Testament and explain for you some words Jesus speak in Aramaic from his own mouth. And probably you know more Aramaic than you think because it's written in the Bible. But let me start with this. I'm going to give you a few examples. Matthew 17, 46. Everyone knows that. Eli, Eli, lemash baktani. Now, Jesus, on the cross, he spoke in his own mother tongue. And the Greek translator was not aware of the depth of the Aramaic and the Hebraic scripture. So he kept the words of Jesus. And it was later translated to Greek, why you have forsaken me? No. What it means in Aramaic, Aramaic is into layers. You can go into like Hebrew, three layers. Aramaic can go to seven layers, which is completion. And in Aramaic, a certain word have different meanings and depend on the context. But only an Aramaic speaking person can understand these words. And in Aramaic, it means Eli, Eli, Elohai, Elohai. Eli, Eli, this is why you kept me, not forsaken me. In Aramaic, Jesus is saying, now I understand at this moment why you kept me to release my destiny on the cross. And the moment Jesus saw the, had this even revelation from the Father, he surrendered his life and he died. Which means the plan of salvation is complete. Shbak means kept, reserved me, kept me for this moment on the cross. So that is the Aramaic of the Peshitta of Jesus. I'm going to give you more examples. Matthew 19, 24. Jesus once said, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, the Greek translator, again, was not grabbing hold of the depth of the Aramaic. He knew some Aramaic, but not so deep. Now, camel, camel in Aramaic have different meanings. Can mean a camel, but it means something else. It means a thick rope. In Aramaic, it's gamlo. The word, the sentence in Aramaic is gamlo. Gamlo is not only a camel. It depends on the context because Aramaic is deep. So what the Greek translator messed up is saying a camel. No, it's not a camel. So gamlo is a thick rope. So it is easier for a thick rope to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven, which means, this is an idiom, by the way, which means that you with a thick rope, you have to try many times, but it will enter, but you have to try many times. You have to have endurance. You have to have patience. Rich people will enter to the kingdom of heaven, but they have more privileges. So they have to try harder to be part of that kingdom, and they will be part in that kingdom. So this is the idiom. Aramaic is idioms. Another one. You know it all also. You heard it many times. Mark, Matthew, Mark chapter 5, verse 41. 
it took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kumi. Talitha Kumi in Aramaic, which means little girl, I say to you, wake up from your sleep. Kumi, we use it in Aramaic, when you wake up. All right, Talitha Kumi. There's more Aramaic words. When Jesus healed the blind man in Mark 7, 34, he looked up to the heavens and with a deep sigh said to him, Iftata, Iftata, which means really in Aramaic, open, open up, pop up, open up, like an order. So and immediately his eyes opened up to know the truth, to see the Messiah. So the Greek translator could not translate that. He kept it the same in Aramaic. You can read it in your scripture, in your Bible. Another one, Raka, Matthew 5, 22. Raka comes from the original Aramaic, Rek. Rek means for someone he's empty. For someone he is like law in the community, is empty from inside. So when you understand the meaning of the Aramaic, raka, emptiness, you understand the verse of scripture. But I say to you, what whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, raka, which means you're nothing, my brother, shall be in danger of the council, but whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hellfire. So when you understand the Aramaic, you understand the meaning. Jesus saying never judge here in this sentence. Anyway, you have more Aramaic words. Golgotha is the place of skull. And also Gabatha, really in Aramaic means stone pavement. And we have so many Aramaic words in the New Testament. So many. Beit Esda, house of mercy. Beit, house. Esda is mercy in Aramaic. Haklid Dima, field of blood in Acts chapter 1, verse 19. Hakel means field. Dima means blood, where Judas committed suicide. Till today, we have this location in the Hinnom Valley. Anyway, there are so many examples. but. The bottom line, today's webinar was the context of Jesus and his languages. And when we understand the context, when we understand the language of Jesus, we can see him in a deeper way through the Middle Eastern eyes.